Thank you, worship band. Do you appreciate them like I do? Yeah. Yeah, we appreciate you guys. Thank you. Hey, good morning, Hillside. I'm Dan Seitz. I am senior pastor here at the church, and it is great to have you for the final week of our Invisible City series. This series has been all about how Scripture illuminates the immaterial realm of reality, the realm of reality that everybody seems to acknowledge as real in a certain way, uh, regardless of their worldview. The realm of reality that people affirm when they talk about things being really right and really wrong. The, kind, the realm of reality that people talk about uh, when they celebrate goodness for the sake of goodness. And the realm of reality that people implicitly affirm when they talk about an event in life being meant to be. Well, this morning we are bringing the series to a close. Of course, you're wondering what's coming up. Two weeks, we're starting something new. It's a two-week mini-series on something that I'm excited about. Next week is going to be a standalone communion service, and I'm going to have a little more to say about that at the end of this service. But let's get to it. Back in 2011, the British theater company Punch Drunk opened a play in New York City. But this play was not your typical play performed before a stationary audience in a typical sit-down theater. You see this company purchased three abandoned warehouses in a distressed part of town. And as the performance space built the replica of a three-story 20s-era hotel which they named the McKittrick Hotel. And it was visually arresting, but also kind of creepy. And when I read about it and saw pictures of the interior, I was reminded of, and I wonder if you remember this, the Hollywood Tower of Terror ride at California Adventure. Do you remember that? Some of you might. I was so bummed when they gave it a Guardians of the Galaxy remodel. I like the original theme, but anyway... Even though this play was called uh, this play called Sleep No More was technically based on Shakespeare's Macbeth, uh, it was very very different. The performance was wordless, and it was primarily just actors pantomiming scenes under moody lighting. But what made this performance unique was that rather than staying in their seats, which there actually weren't any, audience members were invited to walk around the room, to go up and down the various floors, and uh, just basically not stay put. The reason was that the whole building was the stage, with the audience sharing the space with the actors. And they were encouraged uh, to pick one of the actors, follow that uh, character through the the performance, and then... um, kind of go wherever that they wanted to go. Well, this unconventional play had a very, very strange effect on many of the people who saw it. And in short, they kept coming back, forking over good money to experience it over and over and over again. Now, back in the day, I had a good friend who saw the movie Titanic six times in the theater. But the devotion of numerous Sleep No No More fans went way beyond uh, Leo and Kate's groupies. Some audience members for Sleep No More were known to attend this play 60 times or more. And they would return again and again, sometimes dressed up like actors and even inserting themselves into the show as they were mildly encouraged to do. And then over and above their revisits, buying tickets and going back uh, again and again, fans of Sleep No More found other fans online and they began sharing their experiences of this play uh, on discussion forums. And they talked about the set. And they dissected the staging and the characters. And most importantly, they speculated together about the show's deeper meanings. And got all sorts of press when it happened. It was quite a sensation. Now, 
I learned about this play in a book by Tara Isabel Burton called Strange Rites, New Religions for a Godless World. And Burton herself is a fascinating figure. She's young. She's only 30 years old. And get this, after earning a PhD in Christian theology at Oxford University, after that, she became a Christian. And the risen Lord Jesus, who she had been reading about in dusty theology books, finally became real to her, presented himself to her, and she became a Christian. She, she gave him her heart. Well, in this book that she's written, Burton uh, talks about the spirituality of the people that she used to hang out with before it was that she became a Christian and came to know Jesus personally. And in this book, she marshals statistics that show what a lot of us uh, are seeing if we just sort of keep our eyes open, that uh, Americans, uh, their formal identification with religion is plummeting. And these are some of the statistics that she gives. She points out that in 2007, the percentage of religiously unaffiliated Americans was 15%. Only 15% of Americans said they had no connection at all with any kind of religion. Today, it's 25%. And for young millennials, those would be people born after 1990, it's 40% and climbing. But then Burton makes a surprising claim, which is the, the beating heart of her very, very interesting book. She says... That while it may be true that in this post postmodern age that we live in, people are becoming less religious, meaning they're, they're going to church less and less, they're hardly becoming less spiritual. And to prove her point, she shares more statistics showing how many religiously unaffiliated people, or nuns as they are known, N-O-N-E-S, still believe in some kind of transcendent being, still believe in some kind of transcendent reality. It's 72%. 72% of the religiously unaffiliated still believe in God in some way, shape, or form. Now, statistics can be kind of kind of bloodless and sometimes kind of boring, but her book really gets going when she begins to show how spiritual so much contemporary culture is. And she gives all sorts of examples from Harry Potter and Star Wars fandom. And for those of you who are over 40, fandom refers to people meeting online to share sequels that they've written themselves to these famous stories to wellness culture that has absolutely exploded and is a major uh, industry worth trillions of dollars and is full of spiritual language about energy and this and that, and even the social justice movement. Well, the question is, what accounts for this? What explains this? What best illuminates this particular neighborhood of the invisible city. What are some possibilities? Well, Freud argued that the religious instinct in, in people, this irrepressible desire to get beyond ourselves and to connect to something greater than ourselves, he said, uh, it's, it's just the effect of psychology. It's just psychological forces. And he says, you know, it's, it's basically uh, projecting wishes for a father on our, our cosmic screen. It's just imagination, just wishful thinking. And I remember that theory because I was a psych major in college. But, but if you really think about it, that seems really quite weak. And I've thought a lot about it, and it seems very weak from my standpoint. And I'll tell you why it seems weak to me. Maybe you can relate, or some of you can. I have a phenomenal father in Douglas Albert Seitz. And I have a phenomenal mother, uh, for that matter. You could not imagine a more generous, helpful, and emotionally invested father. And my 
twin brother, Darren, and I like to say that when we were born, we won the father sweepstakes and the mother sweepstakes as well. And yet, I still have an irrepressible craving for God. Even though if anyone has an ideal father, I do. And I long to be found in his son on the last day and to inherit the new world that's coming and all of the wonders that that world will contain. So I'm not convinced by Freud. I don't think that explains it. What would another materialistic explanation be? In his book, Sapiens, which is a major bestseller for, from about five years ago or so, the uh, historian Yuval Noah Harari, he explains the irrepressible human spiritual impulse uh, this way. He says it's a response to the agricultural revolution and the fear that one's animals would not reproduce. That's how he sort of explains the irrepressible spiritual impulse in human beings. And now think about that for a second. I mean, does that sound plausible to you? Does that sound believable to you? It doesn't to me. I mean, I would not be able to convince myself that the nearly universal longing for something more than the material world to connect with something outside myself is really attributable to our ancestors 12,000 years ago stressing over whether their lambs would give birth, okay? I don't see it. You see, for me, the answer that Scripture gives the explanation, the account that the Bible gives is so much more compelling, so much more satisfying than either Freud's or, uh, say, that of contemporary anthropologists. You see, according to ancient scripture, human beings are irrepressibly spiritual because God really exists. And God because that God has implanted a memory of himself, a memory activated by experiences of beauty like we talked about two weeks ago. The scripture says that human beings keep reaching out beyond themselves in all of the myriad ways that they do that, like uh, going to see a crazy New York City play 60 times in search of some transcendent meaning, because they have been made to do that. God has created them to seek him. Listen to what the Bible says. This is Acts 17, verse 16. This is Paul speaking to the Athenians. And Paul says, And God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. And then skipping down to verse 27. Why? That they should seek God. And perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Yet he's actually not far from each one of us. And in contrast to Freud or in contrast to the, uh, the anthropologist that uh, we talked about, Scripture teaches that the human spiritual impulse, it's not an accident. It, it's not a false alarm. It's not a vestigial organ like the appendix. It has a true correspondent. And that correspondent is the creator God himself. That's why every human being feels the desire to reach out. And friends, according to scripture, human beings are spiritual because a spiritual realm exists. And God exists. And he wants to be found. And in fact, he wants to be found so much that he's already come to us in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, his own son, his own second self. Now, if you're here today, either in the room or, or maybe you're watching online and you're here because you're investigating Christianity, maybe the invitation of a friend who said, you know, come to, come to Hillside and, and discover, uh, learn about Jesus here. If that's you, first of all, welcome. We're so glad you're here. We won Hillside to be a place where people can explore Jesus. But that a personal God exists is not hard to believe when we look at Jesus of Nazareth, 
The one who claimed to be his only begotten son, the one who claimed to be with him from all eternity. You see, Jesus' life was a miracle of justice and goodness, far surpassing the, the moral perfection of even our brightest moral luminaries, our brightest moral stars, whether somebody like Martin Luther King Jr., or Abe Lincoln, or Nelson Mandela, they themselves acknowledged their flaws and their failures. And if they didn't, their biographers did. They made sure that people know. At you know, the very end of David Garrow's long and very, very complimentary uh, biography of Martin Luther King Jr., Garrow quotes King's daughter, Yolanda, to this effect. At the very end of the book, in the epilogue, kind of surprised me. She said, basically, you know, don't, don't divinize my dad. Yes, he was a great man, and he was a great American, but he was hardly perfect. And it's telling that Jesus' biographers, the ones who wrote his story, never report anyone saying anything like that about Jesus. And it's telling that Jesus' biographers never quote Jesus as saying, you know, my bad, <laughs> all on that, that's on me. Never. Because even though Jesus was humble, Jesus could not have acknowledged personal fault and at the same time remained truthful. His life is extraordinary. And when we look at it, the reality of a creator God becomes quite plain. Now, I find that scripture's account of the, of the universal spiritual impulse to be very, very compelling, okay? But let me tell you something. My confidence grows even greater when I consider what it says in very particular terms, um, what else it says about human spirituality. And, and here's what it is. Scripture says over and over again that humans have a tendency towards idolatry, towards worshiping other gods. And it gets at this in all sorts of different ways. Uh, the first commandment is to have no other gods before God himself. And in the constant attention that Scripture gives idolatry, the Bible is actually saying something very interesting. It's implicitly saying not only what we've already established, that all human beings are irrepressibly spiritual, but it's also saying something else. It's saying that irrepressible spiritual instinct can also go awry and often does, meaning that human beings often cast God in their own image. And if you think about it, don't we see that everywhere? Don't we see that wherever we look? I mean, we certainly see it in the contemporary Western world, don't we? We see human beings openly fashioning God to fit their own instincts, their, their own wishes. In fact, in her book, in Burton's book, which I've been talking about this morning, she says something so interesting. She says that the phrase that she kept hearing over and over again when she would interview contemporary people about their spirituality was this. I create my own religion. Over and over again. And for me, here's the point. that The sophisticated biblical account of human spirituality, again, that it's irrepressible. You can't really stop it. But also that it tends to go awry. It, it tends to go away from its true end, which is God itself. It underscores the Bible's trustworthiness. It makes us think it really knows what it's talking about. And if it knows what it's talking about there, maybe it knows what it's talking about everywhere. You know, we've said from the beginning of this series that, you know, by downloading, really taking seriously what God's word has to say about the invisible city, we, we, we get a couple of benefits and one of those benefits is that we can live more wisely. We can live better. We can live more fruitfully. And I think 
that from Scripture's particular take on spirituality, we can deduce a significant piece of wisdom that can actually make a real difference in our lives this week and in uh, the weeks to come. And here's what it is. It sounds kind of simple, but I'm going to unpack it, and I think it's important. Here's, here's the wisdom. We should seek and savor God for who he is. Let me say it again. We should seek and savor God for who he is. We should take him on his own terms. And you're going to hear me saying this a lot over the years that follow. The God of the Bible, the one true God, the one who exists, he's very particular. He, he's not a generic God. And because he's particular, and like any person, even a singular divine person, the one true God wants to be known and wants to be appreciated for who he is, for who he really is. And, you know, we can arrive at that idea that God wants to be appreciated and known and loved and adored for who he is just on the basis of simple intuition. Think about this. Do this thought experiment for a second. Think about it. All people, regardless of who they are, every single one in this room right now, every single person watching online, wants to be known for who they are, wants to be appreciated and understood as individuals. We're not pleased when the people around us don't know us. And when the people who are really close to us, with whom we're sharing life, don't know us and don't understand us, it's particularly painful, isn't it? As human beings, we want to be known. We want to be understood. Well, here's the question. Why should it be any different with God? The one in whose image we are made. You know, none of us wants to be mere projections of others' wishes, and neither does God. And in fact, there's actually some relationship wisdom here. I thought a lot about this over the years. You know, if we want closer relationships, including closer relationships with our fellow hillsiders, you know what we should do? We should do more of what so many hillsiders are already doing. You know, when we're hanging out at the bridge or in the parking lot or in our home groups or at Edge or Riptide or wherever else, we should really work to remember the things that our fellow hillsiders tell us about their backgrounds, their interests, their families, their experiences. And here's why most of us feel deep affection, even love welling up in us when other people remember the things that we have shared with them. And then they ask us about them. You know, I have a friend, a good friend named David Vinson, who does this better than anybody I have ever known. He's, he's very busy. He's a doctor. He's got an exploding research career. He's got a million friends. But here's the thing. When I mentioned to him something coming up, maybe I have a stressful uh, week ahead or I have something exciting on the calendar, despite his busyness, he will remember and he will ask me specifically about it. I'll get a text, I'll get a phone call, I'll get a card in the mail telling me he remembers and he's thinking about it. And when he does, I feel so cared about. Bonds us even further together. And I need to do a much better job with him. And in fact, all my friends, and I'm trying to do that. Well, here's the point. What's true of humans is true of God. He wants to be known for who he is. And the Bible's clear about this. Listen to this passage. Psalm 46.10, a passage you know, but maybe it will pop for you in light of our topic. God says, the word says, be still and know that I am God. Not somebody else, not some other God, not a God we make up in our own minds. In Hosea 6.6, 6, God says of himself, for I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. And get this, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And then Jesus says the same thing in chapter 4, 23. Those who worship the Father must worship in spirit and in truth. God wants to be known and adored for who he is. Well, what could this mean practically? Let me give you one possibility. 
It could mean that as hillsiders, as we live out our calling as light bearers, developing relationships with people and explaining the gospel with uh, spiritually curious people and inviting them into God's loving presence, it could mean that we gently advise against spiritual remixing. What do I mean by that? Another big idea of Burton's book is that the kind of spirituality that characterizes the nuns of today is remixed spirituality. She's, she's really demonstrated that. And, and, and what that means is sort of uh, smorgasbord spirituality. You know, taking a little of this and a little of that and turning it into our own spiritual soup. It's going to church on Easter and then later that week meditating over a $185 Nepalese singing bowl that we purchased from Gwyneth Paltrow, okay? God wants to be known. And God wants his particular self and his particular wishes and his particular plan for the world to be appreciated for its own terms. And when you think about it, you know what? We wouldn't want it any other way. We want that God wants to be known and appreciated and approached for who he is. And the reason is obvious. After all, a God whom we create according to our own wishes is nothing. An illusion. A fantasy. And a God that we create from our own imagination can't do any of the wonderful things that the real God, the God who really exists, wills to do for us. What are some of those things? What does God will to do for us? Because he's real and loving and alive and here. What does he will to do for us? Psalm 138 gives us a basket full of them. I mean, just listen. According to the inspired writer of the poem, the true God He desires to increase our strength of soul when we cry out to him. I mean, do you find that from time to time you need increased strength of soul for the challenges that are before you? More emotional grit to persevere, to keep going, to love that person who's difficult. You know what God wills to do? He wills to give you that strength of soul. Psalm 138 says it. An illusory God can't do that. What else does he long to do? He longs to preserve our lives in times of trouble. The psalmist celebrates that. Are you experiencing any trouble right now? Something that you're anxious about? You know, the true God, the God who exists, wills to preserve your life according to his sovereign plan. And you know what else the psalm says? It says that the one true God who exists right here will and wills to fulfill his purpose for us. God has a purpose for you. God has a purpose for me, and he wills to fulfill it. And if we submit to him and look to him as the God he is, he will, he promises to. Now, are there mysteries? Of course there are. Sometimes God operates in ways that make perfect sense to us. Other times he works in ways that are very mysterious. But those mysteries aside, the God of Scripture, the God who really exists is a God who is living, and active in our lives, and by contrast, a God that we make up, that God can't take any action in us, for us, through us. Nothing. Speaking of giving soul strength when we need it in times of trouble, last month, I read a really interesting magazine article by two Wall Street Journal reporters telling the story of the Nigerian schoolgirls who were kidnapped and then released about seven years ago. I bet some of you remember the story. I think Doug does. And one night, I'll remind you if you don't, 300 Nigerian schoolgirls are relaxing in their dorm rooms after a day of finals. And without any warning, their campus is invaded by AK-47 toting Boko Haram militants. Come in and grab them and cart them off to the wilderness. And during their captivity, they, they really endure a lot. You know, they're, they're threatened, uh, they're beaten, they're underfed. It's, it's misery. 
Two and a half years later, they're released through the work of all sorts of different kinds of people, just an interesting collage of interested people, diplomats, soldiers, spies, human rights experts, a really interesting story. Uh, but what's important for our purpose is this. When they were interviewed upon their return, not least of all by the journalist I was telling you about, these girls were emphatic about something. And it was part of the story that got screened out in some, uh, some reports of what happened. They were emphatic that it was the true God, the God of the Exodus, the God of the Bible, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ who sustained them. That it was that God who they cried out to in confident faith every day. And they report that throughout their captivity, they prayed together. They sang Christian songs together by the Nigerian Christian pop artist Mama Agnes. I'm going to get one of her CDs. And they copied pages out of the one Bible they had into their little personal notebooks. They clung to the one true God. What's the point? Friends, only a real God can provide real rescue. And more broadly, only a real God can intervene and interrupt and orchestrate wonderful things in our lives. And that's why we want to take him on his own terms. Although it didn't uh, make it into Roman Mars's book, The Invisible City, which of course is the book that gave us our uh, series title, in, in recent years, and especially during the pandemic, city planners have experimented with a brand new kind of park, I love this, called Found Parks. And Found Parks don't require any actual materials to construct, no sod, no swing sets. They're constructed, you see, out of the creative use of time. And one of the first found parks was created in Cambridge, Massachusetts. City officials did something kind of interesting and very simple. They closed off a stretch of Memorial Drive, which is a, a beautiful uh, road that goes right next to the Charles River, just for a few hours on weekends, Saturday and Sunday, and just by closing off this stretch by the waterfront, presto, they had a new park. And what was once a busy street instantaneously became, at least temporarily, a new riverside park for strolling and skateboarding and neighbors just coming together and hanging out. I tell you that for this reason. This week, I want to invite you to build a spiritual found park by carving out five minutes every morning this week to pray this prayer. Okay, very specific. Here's what I want you to pray in your own found park. Dear God, Father of the Lord Jesus and giver of the Holy Spirit, I praise you for your particularity. And with the power you provide, I open my eyes to you and I eagerly await the ways you will intervene, you will interrupt, and you will orchestrate in my life this week. And I believe if we pray this prayer together individually and collectively as a church family, the real God, the one who really exists and who really loves us, and who really has proven it by giving his son on the cross to die for us, that God if we pray, we'll take some kind of identifiable action in our lives this week. I think he will. He'll give us a person to love. He'll give us a heroic deed to do. He'll give us a true word to speak, a helpful word. He'll give us a lesson to learn. Or he'll give us a gift to receive. And next week during our communion service, we're going to have a God at work segment. And during that service, you're going to have the opportunity to share what that one true God did when you prayed that prayer and you invited him to interrupt, intervene, orchestrate something new in you. Okay? Let me pray for us. Father, 
as a community of your beloved children, united by your Son and Spirit, we want to honor you by taking you on your own terms, appreciating you for who you really are, and by doing enjoy all the benefits of a God who exists in truth, independent of our will and wishes, and who is able to take dramatic action in our lives, even this week. And we pray that this would be a week in which you intervene to direct us, maybe along a new path, or you interrupt our plans in order to teach us something that we need to learn, or you orchestrate events in such a way so that we're blessed and graced in a way that we didn't anticipate. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen.